Well, welcome back to Living the Word. We're glad you decided to join us again today. And if this is your first time joining us, we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in. We have been on this journey for quite some time. We began in Matthew at the Sermon on the Mount, looking at chapters 5, 6, and 7. And now we are in Galatians 5, looking at the fruit of the Spirit. On last week, we looked at love, and as we work to understand just what type of love God is calling us into, we learned this love is agape love, and it's the primary motive of agape love is unconditional love. It loves in spite of. It, it doesn't have to have a reason to love. It loves the way it loves regardless what the other person does. That's what we have determined agape love means. And in our introduction to this class, if you recall, we challenge ourselves to take a fruit inventory every week. That's right, a fruit inventory every single week, focusing on the particular fruit of our Sunday discussion. So with that in mind, tell me, what did you learn about agape love last week? And how does it differ in your mind from other forms of love in the Greek language? Can you see yourself, and this is a good one here, a big one, can you see yourself exercising agape love in all of your relationships? Can you love the difficult person in your life with agape love? That one is difficult. I, I understand. So, let me ask you, how did you do? Well, if you couldn't answer all of those in the affirmative with a yes, then this could mean that you have some more work to do. And so, because, and this is the point. In Matthew 5, 46 and 47, Jesus expressly talks about our relationships and how we ought to relate to others in particular. Let's look at let's look this text up in the Bible and find out what Jesus had to say about it. He says, "If you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that?" So, before we get into our fruit this week, let me remind you once again, when Jesus ultimately compares something to a tax collector or a pagan, it's never a good thing. So I want to encourage you to go back and take a closer look at the love in your life and ask yourself, what does God expect me to do with this? How am I to love others? How am I to love my families? How am I to love my neighbor? And if this is a struggle for you, think about who you were when God allowed Jesus to die for you. And I think, you know, that's the, that's the breaking point right there. If you work from that perspective in all of the fruit of the Spirit, you will always come back to the same place is that it's because of God's great love that I extend that to others. I extend kindness. I extend um, long-suffering and patience. I extend, extend self-control. All of these things I extend to others because of His great love for me. So if you think about the love of God for you, that as Romans 5, 8 says, when we were at our worst, when we were still in the middle of our sinning, Christ died for us. Perhaps that may inspire you in your relationship with others to love them greater. So let's turn our attention to the fruit of the Spirit today because uh, today we're going to consider joy. Today our subject is joy, but before we do, um, if you hadn't gotten your Bible already, you may want to do that. Um, let's together bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time once again to study your word. Father, we pray in this 
thank you for each that have tuned in to this this uh, class today, realizing it's a little difficult under these circumstances uh, with COVID-19 still raging. And Father, we just again thank you for the technology that enables us to continue on um, through this, knowing that even though we're separated in bodily form, we're still united in spirit. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, for those that are joining us from other places beyond Port Huron and beyond Michigan even. And wherever they are in their part of the country, Father, let your word speak to their heart as well. And, and through it all, Father, let us grow closer in our relationships with you. We realize, Father, that this pandemic is just another reminder of things, um, signs of things yet to come. And we know that Jesus one day will show up in some form, whether it is um, with his angels in the clouds or through our individual deaths, he will show up. And Father, this is all in preparation, what we do today, to be ready for that time and that moment. So teach us how to live your word every day. Teach us how to put it into practice in our lives every day so that we are your instruments of peace in this world of hostility and we are light in this world of darkness. We thank you again for your word and its power and its might and its ability to prick our hearts and to move us from where we are to where you want us to be. And Father, I just pray for those that have a sincere desire to walk in your ways and follow in your footsteps. We thank you so much for them. And we thank you, Father, for the cross and its redeeming power to bring us to a place where we can be considered sons and daughters. We love you, we praise you, we magnify you in all things this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I want to begin by looking at two very commonly compared things that are really dramatically different in many ways. That is joy and happiness. Some use it interchangeably, but I want to suggest today that when you look at joy for what it purely is, you'll see there's quite a bit difference between joy and happiness. The easy way to think about joy in my mind is to think about something that comes from the inside. It's all the stimulation comes from something within, um, and I'll explain this later in detail. And happiness, on the other hand, uh, can be stimulated by external circumstances. You know, I'm going to go out on a limb and give you an, an example of, of happiness and, and say to those that have received stimulus checks that they brought happiness to a lot of people. And you may be one of them. Hopefully you were. Happiness is a controllable emotion. We can create happiness at will. All we have to do is engage in the things that, which make us happy. Makes sense, doesn't it? Of course. But joy is different. Joy doesn't operate that way. In fact, joy is a gift from God because joy comes with the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the gift that's packaged as part of the fruit of the Spirit. Remember what I said last week concerning the fruit of the Spirit. You get all nine attributes concerning the fruit of the Spirit through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Not five, nor seven. And unfortunately, neither can you pick the ones you want and leave behind the ones you don't particularly like. Look at the list again. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, my hunch is that many of us would like to leave patience and self-control behind if we could. But as I mentioned last week, it's a one-size-fits-all. It's a package deal. It's an all or nothing. And in our remaining time, we're going to focus on joy. So let's begin by just asking a question. What exactly is joy? 
And I want us to begin in our thinking with looking at joy as an internal outpouring, where happiness is an emotion in which we experience feelings ranging from contentment and satisfaction to bliss and intense pleasure. You can experience pleasure that makes you happy and can be, get this now, spiritually bad for you at the very same time. Joy is a stronger, less common feeling than happiness. We experience joy when we achieve selflessness. There it is. We achieve joy when um, we experience joy when we achieve selflessness to the point of personal sacrifice. We feel joy when we are spiritually connected to God or to people. So you may ask, how do I know when I have it? Well, joy comes out of your being because now your life is in harmony with God. Joy doesn't have to wrap itself in anything that on the surface would look like happiness. You can be tormented physically for following Jesus and still have joy. Now, I would question and challenge, if you were being tormented physically, I don't think you would be happy. I don't think you could say, I am happy in this torment. But you could say, I have joy because my will is giving over to the will of God in this moment, in this predicament. And because of him and his sacrifice, I also now suffer. So what I want us to understand is you can have experiences of the worst human tragedy, the anything that you can think of a, a horrible human tragedy and still find joy because and this is a key of joy it's stronger than your circumstances do you see joy that way it's stronger also than your experiences joy is deeper than an emotional connection to something joy comes from god he is the originator. He is the source of it. And it is knowing despite that, that all that you are and all that you have done, and get this, this is where joy springs from. Think about it. All that you are, all that you've done, God loves and accepts you unconditionally as his child. Now, it's kind of hard to, to wrap your head around because it's a really big statement. And I know that for those that are beginning their walks with God, um, this, you're very early on in your Christianity, this is a hard thing to try to figure out. But I want to say this, don't try to figure it out because joy isn't something you do. Joy is something that happens out of you. So your focus should be on pleasing God and walking in the ways of God, and this will happen on its own. So think about it. And back to that statement that I just made a moment ago. Think about this, and this is what, for me, brings joy. A holy and righteous God loves messed up me to the degree that he wants us to be his sons and daughters and wants to walk in fellowship with us. You know, it's when you sit and contemplate what I just said that you ultimately arrive at a place where it baffles you that God will want to do that with you. He wants us to be his family. Holy and righteous God wants cracked up us to be his family? Absolutely. He wants you to be a son. He wants you to be a daughter. But more than that, 
He wants to be a part of your life daily. He wants to be a part of your decisions daily. And that's different for us because it's so, so against what our society pounds into our head of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and just do it. And, and all of those mantras that, that signify selfishness, Joy says just the opposite. God says, I want to direct your footsteps. I want to be a part of your life. I want to help give you wisdom in the things that you decide to do. I want your life to be abundant. Now, that doesn't mean rich and full of stuff. It means the quality of your life is abundant, not the quantity of it. We've kind of gotten off track of that from our friends on TV, so you got to be careful with that one. That's never what God implied, and we can know that by looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. If there's one person that has given more of his life on paper to, to God than anyone else, it would be Paul. I think undoubtedly he has shown us every aspect of his life, and abundant riches was never on the list. Matter of fact... I would go so far as to say it was the exact opposite. Paul was in prison. He was beaten. He was stoned. You know, you know the you know this text, and and you know what he went through. But he still had joy. See how that works? So there's more to it. So let me see if I can. I'm going to use a very difficult example to express to you what joy looks like. Because joy is given by someone, God, as something that we don't deserve. But because of his love for us, we experience joy. I'm, I'm struggling to give you this, but I'm going to go ahead and, and do this. Um, especially in the light of the timing of what's going on um, when this happened. This is back in, this illustration comes back from, from the days of slavery. Tough times. So, I know. Stay with me. I think you'll like the way this ends. So, the story is told of a young woman that was on the block to be sold as a slave. I'm not happy about it either. It's just, it's what happened, okay? And as is customary, as she stood there, the potential bidders would walk up and examine her and, and check her out to see what they wanted to bid. So this is what is hard. So now the bidding begins. And these guys that have come up there and checked her out, and just keep, get the picture in your mind. They have checked her out, but she wasn't happy about it. As a matter of fact, she gave, a, she gave them attitude of the highest degree to discourage them. She didn't want to be sold naturally, and so she didn't like them. If she picked up something, she would you know, give them some attitude or, or do something in a way that would make them lose interest in her. So the bidding went on. And at the end of the auction, she was sold. But an, an unusual twist in the story was the man that purchased her, she didn't, she didn't know him from the fact that he never came up and examined her. She never recognized him. He was just someone in a crowd that, that bid on her and ultimately won her. So when he approached her and said, I just won the bid for you, she threw him attitude, as you would suspect, because she's not happy. But he said something very uniquely strange to her, something that she couldn't understand because she knew what to expect. She expected to go home with him and be a servant of his, but that's not what he did. 
he told her, he said, I want you to know that I paid a lot of money for you. And I and and she said, Well, okay, then I guess I'm your servant. He said, No. I paid a lot of money to set you free. I felt it was unfair for you to be sold as a human being to another human being. And I have the money, so I bought you, and now I am setting you free. You don't owe me anything. You're not my servant. You're a free human being. I told you it's going to end up better than it started. Now, can you imagine in that day and time how that would impact her? Think about it. That didn't happen. We know from history that never happens. But in this case, it did. Because of who he was, he gave her something that she felt she didn't deserve. She wanted it. But under the circumstances, deserving is a very hard word to use because typically people were sold into slavery. But she didn't get that. She didn't get slavery. She had freedom. What was interesting about the story as it continues on, she was so blown away by what he did, she offered herself to him as a slave. Isn't that surprising? Now this person that didn't want to be a slave offers herself because she feels obligated because he bought her. But he said, no, you're free. Go your, go your way and enjoy your life in freedom. Now, I think that was a great story that illustrates to me in many ways what God has done for us. We were like her, but, but we weren't slaves to things of, or other people. We were slaves to sin. And God comes along and purchases us with the cross of Jesus. And it's through that love of purchasing us, while we were still sinning, he sets us free. So that we can be sinners no longer. So death can have a hold on us no longer. So eternity now is a good thing and not a bad thing. And he did that all because of his great love. And it's from there, from that thought, for me, I don't know about for you, but when I stop and think about that, that's what brings me joy. That brings me great joy to know that God would do that for me. So when we think about joy, that's why I said it, it flows from the inside of us because of of something that, that God has done that we recognize and realize is beyond our human comprehension. And so we say, Lord, thank you. Thank you isn't enough. So from the bottom of our hearts. And what's really unique about joy, we don't, uh, joy, we don't express joy as, a, a, as we do laughter and a smile by choice. Joy expresses itself in its own way. And, Sometimes this joy shows up in, in just jubilation. And other times it shows up in tears of gratitude. Never of sorrow. It's, over, it's overwhelming gratitude that I sit here with tears in my eyes. Thinking about what Jesus went through on the cross for me. And I deserve none of it. So that's what joy is all about. I believe that when we look at joy and sum it all up, it comes down to this. In Hebrews 12, 2, the Bible says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You know, it's obvious to us as human beings, the cross didn't bring him joy. It said, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. The joy that was before him was looking beyond the cross. The joy was seeing what was on the other side of the cross and better yet, who was on the other side of the cross? You and I. And he knew he was doing the will of the Father 
according to Luke 22, 42. What Jesus did was not for his benefit. He was not doing it to make himself happy. His joy came through this very selfless act of dying on the cross. So let me ask, do you want joy in your life? Then seek to do those things that glorify God without any thought to benefit to yourself. And as you grow spiritually, continue to align your life with the will of God and you will experience great joy. So let me give you your homework for this week. What, you thought you weren't going to get any? Of course you are. Your homework this week is to look for ways in which you can bless others regardless what the cost or sacrifice is to you. It's going to be interesting. Can look for ways to bless others regardless of the cost or the extent of the sacrifice to you. And in so doing, here it is, ask God to, to, to direct you to these people and then bless them with your entire focus on pleasing God. And then we're going to talk about your progress next week. So until then, we just want to thank you for tuning in. We pray that as you continue on this spiritual journey through life, that you will take every opportunity every day to be who God wants you to be. And remember your purpose. Your purpose is far beyond the happiness in your life. Your purpose is representing God as one of his ambassadors. Imagine that on a grand level. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ as I walk on this earth. And everywhere I go, every thought in my mind is how can I bring glory to my God who did it all for me? How can I glorify him regardless of the cost? I think, no, I know. You're going to have an interesting week this week. Give attention to that. Don't dismiss it. Don't walk away from this moment. If you need to, go back and watch this again and rejuvenate yourself in your thinking. But allow God to use you. And I guarantee you and promise you, as you do this, it will open you up spiritually in ways you have, you, you just can't imagine. And at the end of it, when you watch God work in your life through you and through your willing heart now, joy will show up and you might find yourself on your face with tears in your eyes, tears of gratefulness saying, thank you, God, for loving me the way you do. Until next week, when we look at kindness, I want to thank you for being part of this class. I want to thank you for going on this journey with us and pray that you'll be back to continue it as we together continue to walk and looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Until then, may God bless you, may He keep you, may He shine His face upon you and give you peace. And to that I stay, stay in and stay safe. We'll see you next week.